So Macau was not, it, it was constrained, but it wasn't isolated. In fact, the fact that it remained connected to both occupied and unoccupied areas uh, was quite important. Um, it was important for uh, various actors and it actually did ensure because its neutral status was advantageous to, to so many for different reasons that it kind of was allowed by these different forces to, to remain um, unoccupied and nominally neutral. Hello, everybody. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming another academic colleague who recently published a wonderful book on the history of neutrality. Dr. Helena Lopez is a lecturer in modern Asian history at Cardiff University in Wales. Originally hailing from Portugal, Helena researched the South China enclave of Macau, which was the first and last European colonial settlement in East Asia. Her study, entitled Neutrality and Collaboration in South China, Macau during the Second World War. This book focuses on the experience of this tiny plot of land, which at the time was controlled by the Portuguese colonial state. Since Portugal declared neutrality in World War II and remained free, its neutrality also extended all the way to Macau, which the Japanese, Chinese Americans and other belligerents actually respected. Although the Japanese did invade Hong Kong, which was on the British rule, of course, they didn't touch Macau. Now, that constellation of a neutral territory in a East Asia led to some very interesting constellations. The book is unfortunately not officially available for free, although some famous online libraries might have a copy for you. But that's why Helena is here today to tell us all about her research herself. Helena, thank you for coming online. Thank you very much, Pascal, for the invitation to present my book. Um, it is a great pleasure to see you again on this occasion, especially as you are the author of one of the few studies on the Second World War in East Asia that has focused on neutrality. Thank you. Uh, you and, know, I... <laughs> yeah, thank you. And you're 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 uh, another one who's like now also bringing the the, sh the the focus a bit to East Asia, because, you know, as always, the Europeans, they only care about Europe. We never care about anything else. Right. So everybody fo focused on that one. Um, anyhow, you are changing that and we are changing that. So um, this talk will be, of course, about history and you prepared a presentation. So can I ask you to start that one? Uh, right. So I should start by saying that, um, you know, my main focus is is on China, uh, not on, on Japan, like some of your previous work, Pascal. I'm also a historian of global connections, not a political scientist or an international relations theorist. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll just provide a brief introduction to the book, Neutrality and Collaboration in South China, the during the Second World War. It came out a few months ago in June 2023. Um, this is my first book, um, draws on about a decade of research with a range of sources from archives and libraries in Europe, Asia, North America, and Australasia. And, um, you know, as you said, the book is, isn't free, unfortunately, but I've added a, a discount code on the slide in case, you know, somebody wants to buy the book or recommend it to their, uh, oops, uh, university library or, um, you know, their local library. So as it says in the title, my book explores neutrality and collaboration in, in Macau, uh, the South China enclave that was, um, as you mentioned earlier, the only foreign rural territory in China to escape formal occupation by Japan between 1937 and 1945. Um, Macau was under Portuguese administration since the 16th century and had um, contested colonial status, um, not really recognized by successive Chinese regimes in the same way that, for example, Hong Kong's colonial status was. Um, we could say Macau remained nominally neutral during the Second World War because Portugal remained neutral in the conflict. And also importantly, because none of the belligerents wanted to occupy Macau. This is linked to one of my arguments that I'll elaborate in a minute on the advantages and uses of Macau's neutrality for actors with competing interests. 1930s and 1940s Macau was a very small territory comprising a peninsula and two islands with a combined land area of only 15 square kilometers. Um, now is about double that size due to land reclamation in recent decades, but you know, still still very small. Uh, and you can see uh, these uh, two islands on the right side of the map 
on the slide and alongside it, you have a view of uh, the Macau city center in the late 1930s, um, very much as it would have appeared um, during the events that the book covers. From the start of an all-out war between China and Japan in 1937 until the end of the conflict in 1945, Macau saw its population rise almost threefold. Uh, it reached around half a million people. And in the book, I show how Macau became a refugee city where the number of newcomers exceeded that of pre-existing residents. In one of the book's arguments pertains to the centrality of refugees in understanding the experience of wartime Macau. So there were various communities of refugees and this shaped the social, economic, cultural, political, and diplomatic experience of this globally connected enclave in South China. The book is not really a work theorizing neutrality. Uh, and I should note, it doesn't really discuss in detail its legal particularities, nor is it primarily concerned with diplomatic negotiations about maintaining neutrality, as many great works on neutrality are. Uh, instead, I'm interested in what I call the lived experience of neutrality during the Second World War in East Asia, focusing on Macau, detailing the ambiguities of its practice there uh, and also in the surrounding areas. And I argue that neutrality was marked by many layers of collaboration involving Chinese, Portuguese, Japanese, British, and other actors. These layers were often overlapping and even contradictory, but intended or not, they contributed to keep Macau under Portuguese administration during and after the war. Uh, so I'll return to the uh, cover slide now. Um, due to its strategic geographical position in the Peru River Delta and the relative weakness of the colonial power administering it that was not perceived as a threat by any of the major belligerents in the region, Macau was at the crossroads of different forces. <clears throat> so its wartime years illustrate the regime competition between, on the one hand, the Chinese central government of Chiang Kai-shek that was resisting Japan, and with whom Portugal maintained unbroken, yet disrupted diplomatic relations. Macau's wartime years illustrate the regime competition between, on the one hand, the Chinese central government of Chiang Kai-shek that was resisting Japan, and with whom Portugal maintained unbroken, yet disrupted diplomatic relations. And on the other hand, Wang Jingwei's reorganized national government. This was the main collaborationist regime in China. And after 1941, with the swift Japanese occupation of British colonial territories in East and Southeast Asia, Macau also regained a crucial importance for the United Kingdom that had been unprecedented since the founding of Hong Kong about a century earlier. Neutral Macau also appealed to Japanese forces who exerted a significant degree of economic control over the enclave, although a formal occupation never occurred, unlike in East Timor. Uh, so despite the frequent assurances that Portuguese officials gave of their strict neutrality, the uses and abuses of Portuguese neutrality in China make evident that it was far more flexible than it was strict. In Macau, neutrality created a space of freedom for actors with antagonistic interests that coexisted and intersected in the territory. The opportunities Portuguese neutrality offered extended beyond the enclave. So in mainland China, neutrality allowed for a range of ambiguous practices from Portuguese diplomats operating in occupied cities, whilst not recognizing the collaborationist authorities there, to the registration of Chinese ships as Portuguese straddled wartime restrictions on transportation, amongst other practices. As for collaboration, um, this has been a key topic of excellent historiography with a focus on China in recent decades, Although engaging with some of the findings of this scholarship, my object of study is somewhat different because Macau was not a formerly occupied area under the rule of a Chinese collaborationist regime. But I do argue, however, that collaboration can exist even without a formal occupation. Keeping in mind the concept of collaboration, even when discussing a formally neutral territory such as Macau is feasible, Contemporary observers remarked upon and resented the increasing Japanese interference in Macau, and indeed perceptions of Portuguese and Chinese collaboration with Japan in Macau existed during and after the conflict. Similarly, comparing events and actions in neutral Macau with areas in occupied China lends itself to recognizing the similarities and differences of this case study. 
I should clarify that obviously I do not wish to underplay the strength of wartime resistance to Japan. Evidence suggests that the vast majority of Macau's wartime residents supported the Allies. But I do point out that in a neutral territory, resistance itself was marked by collaboration. I argue that instances of collaboration with Japan in Macau need to be considered alongside other often stronger cases of cooperation with Chinese forces or inter-imperial collaboration with the British that can be seen as forms of collaboration that do not involve an occupying power. And in the case of Chinese resistance, these forms of collaboration challenge the myth of a Portuguese strict neutrality, although um, Sino-Portuguese local understandings in Macau did not represent a state policy of support for China's anti-imperialist resistance, but were actually ad hoc experiences responding to displacement and other contingencies of the conflict. Although diplomacy is paramount to understand neutrality and collaboration in Macau, and the book can in some respects be seen as a work of international history, I stress that the practical everyday constraints and opportunities of neutrality and collaboration went beyond decisions made by government policymakers and diplomats. So Macau's global connections vividly come to light when we consider the ramifications of the social impact of the war. Uh, people in Macau, either pre-existing residents or refugees, suffer the effects of the conflict in ways similar to other areas in China. And this brings me to another of the book's key arguments, that instead of emphasizing Macau's isolation and exceptionalism during the war, the book places its multiple regional and global connections at the center. <clears throat> So I observe multiple and striking parallels with more often studied neutral foreign rule territories in China, namely the Shanghai International Settlement and French Concession during the so-called Lone Island period of 1937 to 1941. And I also note both similarities and connections uh, with British rule Hong Kong and French rule Guangzhou Wan before the Japanese occupation. And I posit that these foreign rule territories were not sealed off and in their nominal neutral peace, they were very much part of the war in China and thus part of the history of China at war. So the book foregrounds the importance of Chinese actors and places Macau as a meaningful location to understand China's global Second World War. From its 1930s origins in East Asia, the conflict involved a variety of international actors with official and unofficial contacts and actions that connected Asia and Europe. Because of its neutrality, Macau is an important intersection, so a meeting place to cite the title of a book on Hong Kong by Elizabeth Sin. And it is precisely the importance and enduring effects of these webs of connection linking different people and locales near and far that I emphasize in the book. So not Macau's isolation, but actually it's many links to different parts of China and also to places further afield. So there is, uh, you know, much more that I can say about this, uh, but I'll perhaps stop stop here and leave other aspects to be addressed in in your questions. I mean, Helena, it's a it's a beautiful uh, it's, it's it's a beautiful study that you did because really nobody bothered before you to try to look at at Macau and you know the neutrals they always have this problem that uh, during war they're under great pressure from all sides. Um, Every side usually says you shouldn't collaborate that much with the other one. So the collaboration, yeah. you know, is always the charge. And on the other hand, then after war, nobody, nobody uh, is interested in them because they they weren't part of it, right? So they're mm. they're falling on the wayside, and they are never part of the post-war uh, structure. Now, mm. in 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 the epilogue, you also point out that this this especially this connections right of Macau that you found out not just as a place for refugees but also for spies and for um for diplomacy actually also for the British and the Americans and the Japanese like everybody was using Macau while also everybody was putting pressure on Macau um and the Chinese of course because we do have three Chinese entities at the same time right mm -hmm. um, that's right uh, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalists uh, whose descendants are today the, the rulers in Taiwan, right? The Republic of China. Uh, Chiang um, uh, Wei, uh, what's his name? Um, well, Wang, Wang Jingwei. Wang Jingwei, who disappeared. I mean, he was the, the Japanese colonial puppet. And we have 
uh, Mao Zedong and the CCP, who are today ruling mainland China. Right? It, it all connects, of course, to today. But of these entities, including the Japanese, like who who was in your study most critical and Portugal, of course, who was most critical for Macau <laughs> to survive mm. and do and, and, and remain remain uh, uh, unharmed? Well, all of these three um, Chinese forces, if you like, so two of them, uh, the Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists and, and the communists, uh, at the time already pretty much led by, by Mao, and the collaborationists, all of them had interests in Macau for, for different reasons. Um, and obviously, neutrality suited all of them, again, uh, for, for different reasons. After the war, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists are very much intent on um, decolonizing Macau, if you like, um, as they are intent on decolonizing Hong Kong, but it, it doesn't happen. And soon after the Second World War, the Chinese Civil War um, begins or, or resumes, depending on the, on the perspective. And this pretty much um, creates a, a different set of priorities that no longer places decolonization in South China at, at the forefront. Um, but all of these three um, kind of sets of actors, if you like, use Macau for, um, you know, to circulate um, information uh, and gather information on, on the other side, um, also to assist uh, Chinese refugees. So all of them um, are, um, for different reasons, interested in, in the plight of this very much increased uh, Chinese population in Macau that, that comes to seek refuge there and obviously expressing concern and, and being involved in, re in refugee relief offers possibilities to legitimize their, their um, kind of nationalist vision because all of them have a vision for, for the Chinese nation, right? Um, and also, of course, to to contact with with foreign representatives um, as well, and especially in the early phase of the war, to try to gather um, their sympathy or or active or active support. Um, so I I wouldn't say there's one particular um, you know Chinese force that is responsible to keeping Macau neutral, but they all make uses of of Macau's neutrality for their own ends, as do. Uh, of course, the Japanese and the British, and, and obviously the, the Portuguese colonial authorities. Um, one of the reasons why the Japanese invaded East Timor, which was also under Portuguese colonial rule, but didn't invade Macau, was because the Australians staged an in, did an invasion. They they staged, I think in your book, you call it an unauthorized mm -hmm. landing. But the Japanese immediately said, you are invading uh, East Timor. We now have to counter invade. Uh, and <laughs> actually, there was a trap. It was it was it was an ally trap to bind Japanese forces in East Timor and fight them there on the on the ground, which transformed East Timor into a into a battleground. And also, frankly speaking, pissed off Portugal very much. Right. Mm -hmm. That Japan invaded. How? Um, how did the Portuguese government view this invasion of East Timor um, and, and did it have an impact on the way the relationship between Portugal and Japan developed over Macau? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, so I haven't actually done uh, research on, on East Timor, but the case uh, does crop up in some of the sources on, on Macau. I think it's an excellent case actually to see the difference between the position of um, the Portuguese government uh, at the time ruled by, you know, um, a, a, an authoritarian regime, Salazar's dictatorship, and um, what was happening on the ground um, in, in East Timor, where actually um, the majority uh, of the, the population actually supported uh, the allies and, and welcomed very much the, the um, Australian and also Dutch forces that uh, made these like an authorized landing or invasion, if you, if you want to call it. Uh, and very much opposed and resisted. So there was guerrilla resistance against the Japanese by both um, kind of Portuguese settlers, uh, many of whom were actually political prisoners that had been exiled, forcibly ex exiled from uh, Portugal. Uh, 
he needs Timur that uh and uh Timur is uh locals and also there is a, a Chinese uh resistance in in Timor as well because Timor had a very significant uh Chinese uh community um for for in and had had for for many decades uh if not centuries so Timor functions almost as kind of a, a warning to what could happen to Macau if uh, resistance became too open and, and too daring to uh, to Japan, that Japan and Japanese forces, um, military forces could simply um, occupy it formally. Um, and that would have um, you know, major consequences for um again, a very large um, population of uh, displaced persons, most of whom were Chinese, but also, and especially after 1941-42, this includes a very large number of allied civilians that are refugees from Hong Kong. Um, so non-Chinese allied civilians, I, I, should, I should add. Um, so Timor is kind of this perennial warning of what could happen if there is um very open resistance in 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 macau but again the position of the portuguese government is is quite ambiguous because obviously what they want is to maintain colonial control over um you know the territories that they already ruled so part of the strategy of engagement with um the United States and, and the UK in particular for Salazar's regime later on in the war is to ensure that um, the concessions that they make to the Allies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Azores have um, a kind of um, response in allowing the Portuguese to recolonize East Timor um, after the war. And that is in fact what happens. And also, obviously, to to keep um, to maintain their control over over Macau, which was not what the Chinese government intended. Yeah, you know, it's this also shows quite well that neutrality, the way the Europeans did it, is part or was part of the way also the colonial enterprise was working. Although this neutrality question was never perennial to the was never paramount to to colonialism colonialism worked in, in in many many different ways but but the neutrality concept was one of them that then that the europeans just extended it's just like okay it also counts for all the territories that we brutally brutally annex and so on uh, but within the this fear of the belligerents that was somehow accepted that's the surprising part which is you know you would think that macau such a tiny little outpost um right next to hong kong which the, the japanese they could just take it right i mean it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't be difficult for them but they didn't want to because it didn't make sense because they wanted uh, an intact relationship with portugal now in that constellation did you find that the portuguese were trying to use you know the carrot and the stick in order to convince the japanese to let leave macau alone and and uh, well i mean leave macau to them I must say that's again a, an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't think the Portuguese colonial administration in Macau had um, that much power <laughs> to kind of shape um, Japanese responses to it. They were very much under pressure, and especially so after the occupation of Hong Kong. It was a very unequal relationship with Japan, in which Japanese forces clearly had uh, the upper hand. Um, and so the governor of Macau at the time and members of the administration were basically trying to operate um, under a, a variety of constraints, uh, also with a degree of self-interest. So it's not like um, the Portuguese colonial administration should be credited with um, you know, saving Macau or saving its refugee population, as it tried to argue later on. But actually, um, they did try to um, deal with um, their Japanese counterparts uh, in a way that ensured that a formal occupation um, would not would not happen. And obviously, um, 
I mean, that also, that did not happen because that did not interest Japanese forces either. They could get everything that they wanted out of Macau without the hassle of a formal occupation, um, which, you know, it is, uh, it involves a set of, of challenges um, that simply they, they could have, um, you know, they, they, they did extract what they wanted economically, um, politically, and especially in terms of intelligence collection out of Macau without having to, to occupy it. So it served them well, neutral as it was, providing that they could actually exert a degree of influence that, that they did. That's that's where the collaboration part of your book comes in, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of collaboration did actually take place between who and who? Yeah, so one of the things that I kind of try to, to argue in the book is actually we need to think about collaboration in these neutral territories as something that can mean many things. So on the one hand, obviously, there is uh, perhaps the most traditional understanding of collaboration, of collaborating with the uh, invading power and its representatives. Uh, so, for example, facilitating the um, transfer of or, or circulation of strategic materials, transport of troops, um, recruitment of laborers, uh, this sort of thing. Um, and also on mm -hmm. the part of the Portuguese authorities, that was, for example, uh, much more openness to censor um, news or to crack down on resistance activities on the part of the Chinese and even the, the British later on. Um, than there ever was any sort of attempt to crack down on, say, Japanese propaganda or activities simply because um, they were powerless to to um, to actually oppose um, the Japanese. But on on the one on the other hand, we also have other instances of collaboration that perhaps other people would see as maybe cooperation, but because we're talking about a neutral territory. If we look at, for example, the Japanese perceptions of what was going on, they also say there is collaboration with the allies, right? And in the allies, I'm including both um, Chinese and British and, and uh, to a lesser extent, um, Americans. But, um, and there is very active on the ground um, cooperation, collaboration um, between different actors, Chinese, Portuguese, British, um, and that is very clear. Um, one of the points that I make in the book is actually that this um, collaboration with the British that was predicated on colonialism, because that was kind of part of the nature of the relationship was that, um, the British in particular were seen as kind of protectors of Portuguese colonial interests. Mm. And the relationship between Macau and Hong Kong comes to, to the forefront in, in, in this. And this was very, very strong. And even the governor that is seen by some scholars as pro-Japanese, I would say that he was um, much more pro-British. Um, and But this had nothing to do with, you know, um, a sort of anti-fascist allied positioning, it was very much rooted in colonial interests. There, there are very beautiful studies that show how these great powers, whether they are fascist regimes, democratic regimes, or even communist regimes, mm. uh, how how when it comes to, to foreign territories, how they all act pretty much in lockstep with each other. The most beautiful study I've seen was about Mongolia and how mm. Tsarist Russia's approach towards Mongolia became exactly, precisely the, the, the same then for the communists mm. uh, after, after less than two years of the communist takeover. So it's kind of geopolitics seems not to care very much about the nature of regimes and it's more, more concerned about, about territoriality. Um, and the, the, you know, the charge from both sides that the neutrals don't support them, them enough and the other one too much is huge. And then also in the framing later on, which is the only question I have, you know, this term of collaboration, um, mm. it, 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 it's, it alludes also to collaboration with the enemy, right? We've had that, we have US laws and so on. And also post-war, you know, it was, it's often then applied to neutral territories. Oh, these territories collaborated with the enemy. But the matter of the fact for the neutrals and also for the territories is 
they were not at war. They didn't have enemies. So collaboration is just normal kind of trade and sovereign right to 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 interact. Now, would you say that um, Macau in the in the war was an example where you know, like the Swedes, which allowed the Germans to pass through their territory, Macau also did things that are just clearly out of the of the box of what we could call like still legitimate neutrality. Oh yes, absolutely. Certainly, the uh, you know transportation of strategic materials was something that different belligerents used Macau uh, for, and also to you know spy on the enemy and collect intelligence. There was also a degree of um, violence that you know can't be can't be denied in this. So Macau was a site of, for example, political assassinations and and things like that. Um, just to go back on the question of collaboration. I think part of my use of the term is also an attempt to kind of link the Macau case to uh, the scholarship on occupied China that has looked at instances of collaboration in various parts of occupied China and actually note the striking similarities in some of the practices uh, that were happening, even though Macau was not occupied uh, formally. Uh, but there are... Um, for example, sources of the period that do describe Macau as de facto occupied, even if not, you know, officially, uh, because the level of Japanese control uh, was very strong indeed, and certainly stronger than any sort of influence that the Allies might have had, especially in the 1940s. So, again, many unneutral things were, were happening, um, certainly on, on uh, transportation, so transportation of troops, transportation of contraband, transportation of, um, again, in the 1940s, we see this very clearly, uh, of, um, you know, Japanese shipping between Macau and Southeast Asia, for example, uh, because then some of these ships are, are um, sunk by um, the Allied forces in the Pacific. Um, and this creates, yeah, a set of challenges for Macau uh, and its um, supply lines as, as well. But um, I think you, you know, wanted to kind of, yeah. Yeah, I would just want to point out that that is actually illegal under the laws of war, because even if there is contraband on a neutral ship, the belligerents don't have the right to sink it. They have the right to board it, take away the contraband, and then and then move off again. But of course, during during great war during wars, that's they they never do that. It's just it's it's funny how these how these um, laws of neutrality are then always kind of twisted in order to impose more restrictions on the neutrals. Whereas the belligerents, they take every right in the world to do mm. all and everything that they want, just in order to curb uh, trade. Um, yeah, so as natural as day and night. Yeah, I mean, in the case of Macau, the issue was that a lot of the shipping, especially in the 40s, um, was being done by Japanese vessels. So okay. these were not neutral ships. So in, it goes, in theory... It, it goes the other way as well, you know. Steve Neff wrote about that beautifully, that also mm. neutral goods on belliger belligerent ships are actually also, in, in theory, uh, cannot mm. be condemned and taken away in practice of course they will be and um, of course yeah and in practice uh, some of these ships were officially transporting you know supplies like um, rice um, that was very crucial to to feed Macau's population uh, mm. but then they also um, transported for example precious metals or um, materials that were used for the Japanese war effort in Southeast Asia and I guess that was the logic behind uh, the ships being being sunk um, but, yeah. but yes the the I guess once the war enters its its final years um, supplies become very very constrained um, and this kind of creates a, a more difficult situation for Macau's very small and population. Yeah, the, the longer the war went on, the more the British and the Americans expanded their contraband lists, which is also the, the oldest trick in the book. In the beginning, it's just like weapons and black powder and so on is contraband. And then in the end, gold and 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 and. Uh, uh, our money and everything is considered contraband so and then a legitimate target so uh, it, it the the more it heats up the the war the more difficult it gets for the for neutral shipping to actually still take place um well i mean 
there are parallels um, with Lisbon, I, I guess, and there are a number of scholars that I've looked at um, Portugal in the Second World War with a focus on Europe. And again, the issues of, of um, restrictions on trade are, are very prominent there. But the other, I guess, the other side of this is also the existence of very, very lucrative wartime businesses in which local businessmen be them in you know in Portugal or in Macau or potentially in other parts of the Portuguese Empire that have not really been studied that much. So we we know very little, for example, of what was happening in Mozambique or or in Goa. Uh, that were also you know um, territories under Portuguese colonial rule that were technically neutral, but all, were also kind of at the crossroads of of different forces, and I'm sure have. And a number of parallels with with the Macau case, um, in terms of you know the arrival of displaced persons on um, new um, constraints on trade, but also new opportunities on trade. And what I see in Macau is actually the rise of um, very powerful local intermediaries that are linked um, and and rise very much in connection to to wartime businesses. Uh, and their privileged position as intermediaries uh, that come to have a, a, a very profound effect on Macau's economy and arguably politics in, in the post-war as well. And I guess, um, I mean, the same could be said in, in, in Lisbon. What do you think your study, in how far does it shed a different light on uh, East Asia and the, the war, because you're focusing on that neutral outpost, of which there were very, very few, very few. So how, what you, after, after, after many, many years and writing it down, how do you view it? How do you view East Asia and the war differently now? I mean, I think my, my book kind of um, is not the only one to make this case, but actually um, places a lot of emphasis on the social history of the war in the sense that it, it sees uh, refugees and you know, displacement in general as absolutely crucial to to understand um, the history of um, East Asia, or or in this case in particular China or South China in in the Second World War. Um, that we we can't simply uh, write you know a, um, a diplomatic history of um, foreign relations. I mean we can, but but we need to factor in the social dimension of this because the scale of displacement was just so incredible and it actually shaped a lot of these other dimensions it shaped um the economy of these territories it shaped the culture of these of these um territories um so one of the most surprising findings for me was actually to see the the scale of um relocation of educational institutions so a variety of schools uh, from mainland China to Macau, and, and this kind of mirrored other relocations that were happening um, to unoccupied areas in China and also initially to other neutral uh, territories under foreign rule, uh, such as Hong Kong. And this actually shaped these neutral territories uh, profoundly. So there is a, a, a true wartime boom in the late 1930s um, that really um, we tend to to think about the impact of uh, refugees in the making of, say, Hong Kong uh, as a Cold War story. But actually, this is very much a Second World War story, uh, too. And, and this precedent actually shapes a lot of the responses in the Cold War uh, in terms of what kind of institutions are involved in refugee relief, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess foregrounding the role of refugees is one of the the key things. And the other one is actually to show the importance of these enduring connections during um, even the years of, of most restriction from 42 to 45. So Macau was not, it, it was constrained, but it wasn't isolated. In fact, the fact that it remained connected to both occupied and unoccupied areas uh, was quite important. Um, it was important for uh, various actors, and it actually did ensure, because its neutral status was advantageous to, to so many for different reasons, that it kind of was allowed by these different forces to, to remain um, unoccupied and nominally neutral. And this 
ended up serving uh, Portuguese colonial interests very, very well because they remained in power. They managed to hold on to colonial control. And then in the post-war wave of decolonization that swept um, Asia, uh, certainly, um, you know, the post-1945 years in China are ones of uh, regained sovereignty over foreign concessions, et cetera, et cetera. But that didn't happen in Macau, and it also didn't happen in Hong Kong. And, and the fact that Macau was neutral and received so many refugees from Hong Kong is, I think, very significant to understand why in those crucial post-war years, um, the British were allowed to recolonize Hong Kong, if you want to put it like that. Yeah, how, how, how they were able to. They had enough people in Macau to just go back and carry, carry on where, from where they were. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, your, your, your study is very important and it, it ties in with some of the recent scholarship also by Marty Abahus and so on, who, who keeps mm. saying, look, we think of the uh, of the Second World War as this moment, like every, like the great powers against each other and the world was fractured and blah, blah, blah. But actually the world was pretty much as it is today, just with way more violence. And there were like a lot of interconnections. Yes, some of them broke down, but not all of them. And a lot of the, a lot of the connections that remained and even cross cross uh, block exchange mm. uh, happened through the neutrals, um, and it served both. It served all parties actually. Yeah, I think that's. I guess one of the fascinating things about studying neutrals, right? How they are, function as intermediaries between opposing sides. Um, and you know, obviously, neutrality also serves the interests of the of the neutrals, as obviously. scholars of neutrality keep keep emphasizing, right? Um, so, in a way, I mean, I guess um, I don't know. Studying territories like Macau allow us to to understand the complexity of these multiple webs of of connection um, between a variety of actors of of different nationalities, but also of you know um, different classes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And how they have to interact because the contingencies of the war uh, require that they interact, and and these interactions are to some extent facilitated by the existence of these um, neutral territories. That if we're talking about colonial territories, as is the case of Macau, you know, are very ambiguous and contradictory. Um, I think the story of Macau is is often told in, in a very uh, positive way as. There is there is nothing bad going on there, but actually, you know, there's very serious things and um, a number of very violent things um, happening, even in a place that is nominally at at peace. Um, but the interactions remain even under constraint, and I I think that's what makes it um, to me at least so fascinating as a case in um, you know as as a case of global connections during a time of disruption. Those are very beautiful words to finish the discussion. <laughs> uh, Helena Lopez, um, thank you very much. And everybody, if you have access, uh, pick up a copy of her wonderful book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh...